Okay, well, why don't we go ahead and get started. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, who, are, who have joined us, I'm Greg Kennedy. I'm a colorectal surgeon at the University of Alabama and a representative today of the SSAT. I'm the recorder of the SSAT. And it's a real pleasure to welcome everybody to our third in our webinar series after the uh, DDW cancel, third of five in the webinar series after DDW cancellation. I think uh, the first two were outstanding. I, was, I happened to log on to last week's and it was just fantastic. And I, looking at today's lineup, it's gonna be equally outstanding, I have no doubt. Our first presenter is gonna be, uh, uh, actually it's gonna be Dr. Stefan Halyabar from the Cleveland Clinic. He's gonna be presenting preoperative hypercoagulable thromboelastography profiles associated with postoperative venous thromboembolism in inflammatory bowel disease patients. Stefan, whenever you're ready, go ahead and share screen and we'll get started. Thank you, Greg, and thank you for everyone who for attending today. And it's my pleasure to present on behalf of my co-authors, my, uh, my research fellow, I uh, was not available today. Um, and today we're gonna be uh, looking at, um, seeing if we can determine preoperatively if we can predict uh, venous thromboembolism in IBD patients. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so as background, I think we all know that um, blood clots and hypercoagulability um, are a bit of an issue uh, for inflammatory bowel disease patients being uh, hematological. Uh, they can maybe considered a hematological extraintestinal manifestation, which is likely driven by the gut inflammation. IBD patients are known to have a threefold higher risk of postoperative VTE compared to control groups. And we know that VTE results in uh, significant short-term morbidity and even short-term mortality in the case of PE and long-term morbidity. So it's, it's not a benign complication. The standard of care um, does not include necessarily extended prophylaxis, and, um, but it does include chemo prophylaxis routinely. Despite this, we continue to see a steady rate of between two and 4% for IBD patients with the majority of these occurring uh, before discharge. <clears throat> However, a, a healthy minority, about one third occur post discharge. So the etiology of this hypercoagulability in IBD has not really been elucidated much, especially as re, um, refers to surgical patients. Enter uh, thromboelastography, which those of you who are closer to general surgery and trauma surgery are likely more familiar with. This is a test which is used mainly for uh, resuscitation for bleeding patients. Um, and it gives information about both platelet function and um, the coagulation cascade and the combination of the two for overall clot formation. And uh, it's, it's affordable, um, it's rapid, and it, ha it can result in actionable action, especially for bleeding patients. It's not yet been shown that it's actionable data can result from this for um, hypercoagulability. And at the bottom of the screen on the right, you can see that it does assess uh, hypercoagulability as well as the coagulopathy and uh, antiplatelet agents or thrombocytopenia. And there's basically, it's somewhat complicated to interpret. Um, you actually have to have a technician draw the graph or the computer draws the graph and gives you these different calculated um, parameters. And uh, in terms of hypercoagulability, um, for the, this is what we've shown is be the um, parameters which are associated with hypercoagulability. So uh, our aim was to determine if preoperative thromboelastography may be used to identify hypercoagulable patients who may be at risk of increased VTE, increased risk of VTE, with the underlying hypothesis that um, thrombo, uh, abnormal thromboelastography or a hypercoagulable tag is associated with postoperative VTE uh, after surgery for IBD. Our methods, this is the single surgeon, single center retrospective one-year study that included uh, mostly consecutive adult IBD patients undergoing major abdominal pelvic surgery. Um, why the, the reason I said mostly consecutive is I had, we had to, they had to have a preoperative tag, otherwise they were excluded. Um, the hypercoagulable profile on the tag was specifically defined according to the literature by a, a combination of at least two of the following, a low R value, a high degree angle, a high max amplitude, or an elevated coagulation index. And our primary outcome of interest was the 30-day venous thromboembolism rate. And this was a retrospective chart review. 
In terms of our patients, we had a total of 55 patients that we looked at. And interestingly enough, uh, 20 of these, 36% actually had uh, hypercoagulability as evidenced by the TEG. There was no difference in um, any of the baseline characteristics, the medications, whether or not the surgery was elective or emergent, although the vast majority were elective, um, whether or not they were laparoscopic or open, um, and the length of stay uh, was equivalent in terms of short-term outcomes. Interestingly enough, uh, for our primary outcome, we found that in the normal patients who had normal thromboelastography, none of them had a venous thromboembolism. However, in the 20 patients who had a hypercoagulable tag, there was a total of three VTEs observed for a whopping 15% VTE rate, which is much higher than the 2 to 4% that we usually see. We next um, stratified the patients by uh, non-VTE versus VTE, and we didn't do any statistical analysis on this to avoid uh, multiple comparisons. Uh, but uh, in general, uh, our, our overall VTE rate for the entire group um, out of 55 was a little bit higher than reported literature, and this may be due to the um, tertiary care center nature of our practice. Um, but what, we, what was interesting was that um, all three of the patients who had VTEs had a high degree angle, a high coagulation index, and um, a overall a hypertag, as we were already aware. Um, looking, drilling down a little bit more on the, um, on the values, um, we did not find a low R value to uh, be um, significantly between, different between the um, VTE patients and non-VTE patients, nor the high um, maximal amplitude, which is a measure of platelets. And before we did this analysis, my hunch was that it actually, the platelets may be paying, playing a part in this. Uh, but you can see the difference in absolute values. They're not that high. So I think we maybe have been underpowered for that. However, we did find that despite a relatively low difference in the values for the um, high degree angle, which is a measure of fibrinogen, it was statistically significantly different between the two groups. And finally, the coagulation index, which is uh, not used for clinical, it's only used for research, was significantly different um, uh, between the patients who did and did not have VTE. Just uh, briefly um, about the patterns of what we saw for the VTEs. Um, as you saw before, it was a mix of both ulcer colitis and Crohn's disease of genders and ages. And one of the um, clots was a deep vein thrombosis. One was a, a um, mesenteric venous thrombosis, and one was a pulmonary embolism. And in general, these were pretty big um, operations that the patients were going on, which again may account for some of, of why we see uh, such a high rate. Uh, of note, all of these patients were getting prophylactic 40 milligrams of subcutaneous noxaparin per day at the time they developed their VTE. In summary, uh, we observed that more than one third of patients with um, IBD have hypercoagulable TEG profiles preoperatively, mostly due to increased fibrinogen uh, activity as an acute phase reactant. The hyper-TEG group had a VT rate of a whopping 15%, while those who had normal uh, uh, TEG uh, had no blood clots, and this was significantly different. Um, at, in conclusion, abnormal preoperative TEG profile was associated with post op VTE, and these hyper-VTE patients appear to be a high-risk group for developing post op VTE, and may benefit from alternative prophylactic uh, and possibly screening strategies. Thank you for your attention. That's a great presentation, Dr. Hayabar. Um, it just really excellent work as usual from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, first, we're gonna open up our the discussion here, Dr. Uh, Alessandro Fischera, another outstanding expert colorectal surgeon from Dallas will be uh, opening our commentary, Dr. Fischera. Thank you, uh, Greg, and great presentation, uh, Dr. Olobar. Um, it, it, this is another paper that uh, highlights the uh, uh, magnitude of the uh, uh, issue with uh, postoperative DVT and PE uh, in patients with inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, we have very clear uh, guidelines for uh, po prolonged DVT prophylaxis in cancer. We don't for inflammatory bowel disease, and I think in part is the heterogeneity of these patients, right? We have a simple iliocolic resections versus uh, the three cases that you have uh, shown, uh, pelvic exenteration, redo pouches, and, and 
and uh, and uh, total colectomy, I believe, uh, was the third one. So it's it's uh, it's a big uh, heterogen heterogeneous group, and it's interesting how you brought back a, an old study that really can give us a lot of information. It's relatively inexpensive and can guide the way we treat our patients long term. Uh, I have some uh, some questions about the, uh, the the methodology primarily. Uh, all these patients have had the uh, Test done preoperatively. Any timing issues, and how many of those actually had uh, the study done while uh, flaring? Uh, you should, uh, and we all know that patients that are flaring have high risk of high incidence of DVT and T. Um, how were the uh, uh, um, uh, patients uh, um, uh, evaluated postoperatively? Did you? Uh, uh, were they all symptomatic and that's why you, uh, uh, you detected these DVTs or did you systematically uh, study these patients with a hypercoagulable uh, state? Uh, because perhaps the incidence could be even higher if you, if you had uh, looked at all these patients uh, uh, based on the result of the uh, study. And, and lastly, one thing that is missing from that demographic table are two important factors. One is smoking history and the other one is obesity. And I'm sure you have the uh, data and perhaps for interest of time did not, uh, did not uh, uh, present it. But overall it's a great work, uh, very provoking. Uh, we should definitely change the way we manage inflammatory bowel disease patients in the post-operative field. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fricare, for those questions. Um, so in terms of timing of the thrombolostography, um, most of the time it was ordered uh, in the clinic and the patients were having it um, done as part of their routine preoperative lab work. Um, the, uh, this actually, since IBD patients are hypercoagulable, there's no issues with reimbursement for this test. Um, I, I had zero problems with that. Um, I tried to get it as close to the time of surgery as possible. And we have some additional um, ancillary uh, CPAs reactant data that will be presented in the paper that we're planning and submitting to the Journal of Gastrointestinal Surgery within the next couple of months. And that also will include the smoking and obesity uh, endpoints or uh, demographics that, that you mentioned. Um, in terms of flaring, that's a fantastic question. Uh, in this series, I did include some patients who were having completion of proctectomies and pouches. And um, my, um, my instinct is that these patients um, are probably not inflamed and that the, the flare is actually what's driving the in increased risk of thromboembolism. I, I think you're exactly right. In terms of how we, uh, in this study, how we detected the, uh, the BTs postoperatively, it was based on clinical symptoms. We did not screen anyone. And that's one of the reasons why there's been a positive research in this area is because this, the, the events are rather rare at it's, you know, it's even 4% is uncommon. And to screen 100 patients with a duplex is be the costs go up very, very quickly. So you really need an R1 NIH type grant to, to answer this question. Um, so we're working on some smaller grants before we get to that. But um, thank you for the excellent questions and I'm happy to follow up on any of them. So if, if I may ask uh, then a quick follow up question, then perhaps the incidence in the hypercoagulable group is even higher. Uh, if you had uh, systematically uh, 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 studied those patients. Very interesting. 15%, as you said, is a whopping 15%. Perhaps it's even higher than that. Mm -hmm. It may be. The, the question with the silent VTEs is um, there's some work by Karen Zanagan and um, <clears throat> Phil Fletchner out of, uh, out of Cedar sinai that showed that there is about a 4% of patients bring a silent VT to the operating room table. They did a, a study where they scanned the patients on the table just before incision and found about 4% of the patients already had a BTE. The question is if that's, you know, silent, is it gonna be asymptomatic or do you treat it empirically? I, I would think, I would agree with you that if a patient has a blood clot, you don't know if it's a bomb that's gonna go up or not and you have to be careful and be conservative and treat it. Great. Uh, we do have uh, 20 attendees who have joined us. Um, so you, for the attendees, you can't actually ask a question verbally, but please, if you have a question, don't hesitate to type it in the chat box. I'll get it and I will ask those questions out to the, to the panelists for sure. So don't hesitate to type them in. Stefan, it's again, just a great talk. I do have one quick question for you. Do you think, I saw one of your patients had an SMV thrombosis. 
do you think that's a different animal than these uh, than the peripheral BVTs? Do you think there's something else going on in these patients? Um, I'm just curious your thoughts on that. I don't really know, but I, I see it occasionally as well in, in these patients with terrible uh, IBD, and I'm just wondering, if, is, it, is this different? Um, you, you know, it's a great question. I think um, what you're asking is, is uh, the SMV um, class that we see typically after a total abdominal colectomy um, or a total proctoclectomy and a pouch, um, where we're basically removing, the, you know, the vast majority of the mesentery, um, that uh, is this a mechanical problem? And I think there is an element to that. Um, on, the, on the other hand, um, you know, total abdominal colectomies for other conditions such as um, constipation, for example, I don't think they have a nearly as high, they have a less than 1% rate of VTE. So I think it's probably, a com I think you're right, it's probably a combination of both. And that would, you know, bring up a study by Leitner from a couple years ago at all from Mayo Clinic who suggested is it the disease of the operation? And they felt it was the operation. And there was a pretty strong editorial rebuttal to that saying, no, it's the disease by one of my new partners, Brad Slau, who's just joined us here. And um, to, to directly answer, I think it's both, honestly. I think it's the operation and the disease. And to Dr. Fakara's point, the, the, if they're flaring and they're actively inflamed, I think those are the people who are most at risk. Yeah. Right. We did get one question typed in here. Uh, it's for prevention of VTE. What you suggest we should do for prophylaxis? So and it's pretty. I think that's actually highly relevant, Stefan, because three of your patients got a VTE on an oxaparin. That's a great question. So, if I may, you know, project out a few years. I think the field is moving. I've been, you know, researching this for a couple of years, about a decade now, and. Um, we were struggling to get people, the physicians and patients, to use extended um, dose uh, post-discharge uh, subcutaneous um, subcu heparin or anoxaparin because this shot and it's painful. And we know that if we're giving subcu heparin or anoxaparin in a hospital, it still might not be enough. So even with the best standard of care, we're having a two to four percent or even five percent VTE rate, which is which should be unacceptable. We should be able to do better than that. So what I'm hoping the next iteration of this is basically a pilot study. I'm hoping to get funded and to do a larger study and to see if we can actually do what the clinical calculators cannot do in IBD and is actually to risk stratify the patients according to the degree of inflammation as manifest on the thromboelectography and other tests. So I might see that the patients who are super high risk, they may require some therapeutic anticoagulation starting 24 hours postoperatively, and people who are ultra low risk may not require anything at all or just standard of care in the hospital. Um, I think that the field is moving and I do have disclosure, I have a grant from the Crohn's Pettis Foundation to study aspirin on this topic. I do think that the field is moving towards oral agents in lieu of injectable agents. The injectable mm -hmm. agents are expensive, the patients hate them and um, their insurance, because they're expensive, and things like aspirin or prophylactic dose eloquis, I think that's where we're heading. Yeah, great. Great. Well, great presentation. Uh, why don't we move on to the second presentation? Our uh, second presenter is, is Professor Vikram Kate, joining us from South India, where it's only nearly one o'clock in the morning. So let's see if we can't get moving for him. He's going to talk about the adapted ERAS pathway versus standard care in patients undergoing emergency small bowel surgery, a randomized control trial. Really looking forward to the presentation, Dr. Kate. Thank you very much. Can I share my slides? Please do. Thank you very much. And I would like to first offer my greetings from my institute, Jipmer Pondicherry, India and we'll share our experience on uh, adapted ERAS pathways versus standard care in patients undergoing emergency small bowel surgery. It has been done as a randomized controlled trial. Now we know that uh, many of the panelists today are colorectal surgeons and uh, the ERAS pathways has started from colorectal surgery. And many proven strategies have been developed for many parts of the elective uh, intestinal surgeries. You have colorectal and now even for pancreatic surgery, you have got a ERAS protocol in place. 
but when it comes to emergency there are many challenges because an important component of iras pathway is the pre operator component which is very difficult to implement in a emergency situation so very few reports had come and uh, we had followed up this report uh, of an rcp of 47 patients where an emergency laparoscopic uh, repair of perforated peptic ulcer was carried out and based on this study actually we we carried out the third one which has been mentioned there simple closure of perforated duodenal ulcer we did a randomized controlled trial with 102 patients there are certain retrospective comparative studies in emergency small series and uh, not much has been reported upon uh, in the eras in emergency so we thought we'll carry out a study on eras in emergency laparotomies for small bowel disorders because to the best of our knowledge right now there is no study which has been documented on this aspect so this study was carried out with the aims and objectives of uh, primary aim of feasibility efficacy and safety of adapted eras pathways we have used the term adapted eras because as i said compared to the conventional eras pathways we had to modify it and the pre operative component is quite limited in this and these patients were undergoing emergency small bowel surgery and the primary objective in any eras pathway or eras protocol is to enhance the recovery and send the patient home early so that is why this was a primary outcome that the length of hospitalization between the standard care and the eras protocol secondary objectives were the time elapsed till we started oral feeding whether there was a need for nasogastric tube reinsertion whether extra analgesics were required any readmission or reoperation was required especially in the eras pathway protocol and the other morbidity parameters like superficial and deep organic space infections post operative ileus pulmonary complications and urinary tract infections this was a, a trial which was carried out in a i'm working in a tertiary care center in india and to carry it from april 2017 to december 2018 it's a single center prospective open label parallel arm security control trial we had actually taken the primary outcome as a, the length of hospitalization and made it a superior control trial uh, it was cleared by ethics committee and that's a number which has the which is the clinical trials registry of india all consecutive patients more than 18 years were included in the study which fulfilled the criteria and all the patients who are undergoing small bowel surgery as uh, emergency plan laparotomy with asa class 1 and 2 were included in the study these patients were excluded irreversible septic shock polytrauma patients pregnant patients and uh, patients who had duration of symptoms for more than 5 days especially with peritonitis many of them were associated with septic shock randomization was done once we decided a decision was made to proceed with surgery block randomization was carried out with four and six computer generated random allocation software and the uh, and the allocation concealment was done with the standard method of snows and we did the assignment of 1 is to 1 ratio to both sides if any if any uh, patient required any procedure apart from simple closure of uh, simple or small bowel perforation small bowel resection anastomosis or a stoma creation they were excluded after randomization from the study uh, in the group 1 we took uh, standard care people and the group 2 was uh, included with eras group of the small bowel surgery length of hospitalization was the primary outcome for with this we calculated the sample size it was calculated as 13 each group and for a drop out of 10% we added and uh, there was a possibility of drop out of 10% intra operatively following randomization so we added again for that 5 in each and the total was 14 each the statistic analysis was done with the help of this software continuous variables like age length of hospitalization duration of surgery time of removal of nasogastric tube brain time of resolution ileus and all that was carried out with the help of independent student t test and the categorical variables were expressed as proportions gender scores need for insertion of nasogastric tube need for extra analgesi and complications were done with the help of a pi square test and the p value of less than 0.05 was considered as significant pre operatively uh, counseling about uh, this procedure we to we mentioned the patient explain about the eras protocol the non opioid multimodal analgesia we used and ultrasound guided uh, internal jugular vein cannulation was carried out primarily for the 
for the uh, CVP measurement, uh, central venous measure, uh, central venous pressure measurement. Intraoperatively, standard anesthetic techniques were used, and we avoided these things: benzodiazepines, morphines, opiates. Short-acting opiates, sometimes when necessary, were used. And uh, in the post-operative phase, non-opiate multimodal analgesia was used. Antibiotics were used for five days. Mobilization was started from day zero itself. Drains less than 100 ml and nasogastric tube less than 300 ml were removed, irrespective of resumption of oral feed or irrespective of the presence or absence of bowel sounds. Nelpar only was carried out till the resolution of ileus, and that was defined as as the identification of bowel sounds. Once it was identified, unrestricted volume of fluid could drive was given. If the patient tolerated for 24 hours, then it switched over to solid. So these were the drugs, all non-opioid were given in the ERAS protocol group. The drains in the standard care group, the drains were removed whenever they were put in an unrestricted liquid diet if the patient tolerated for 24 hours. In the patients in the standard care group, when the nasogastric tube was removed less than 100 ml per day, and they were with signs of resolution of the ileus. In the standard care group, the nilpar oral was started once passage of platus was defined as uh, bowel sounds, restricted volumes of PFL started, then gradually increased, and then we started in soft diet and normal diet as tolerated. This is the time uh, file of what I have shown. This is the timeline. Analgesia, these are the drugs which were used, epidural anesthesia, and some of the patients which was given and was stopped on day two. And as I mentioned earlier, nasogastric tube and the drain were removed, less than 100 ml and less than 300 ml. Orals were started immediately on the day of surgery at 12 hours. Assessment was done for bowel sounds. Every six hours it was done. The moment bowel sounds were identified, the patient was started on liquid diet and slowly switched off to solid diet. And the patients were ambulated at six hours and then gradually improved. Antibiotics were given from the start when the patients admitted and up to day five. Intolerance to diet in any form was defined as this pain of moderate and severe intensity to episodes of vomiting, any episode of diarrhea or abdominal distension. Once this had settled, then the patients were again started on orals. Discharge criteria was tolerate solid diet for at least uh, 24 hours and passage of flatus without complications. Follow up was done at 10 and 30 days, and any complications or need for readmission was noted. Uh, we can see here uh, intestinal obstruction, perforation, gangrene of the gut to the predominantly operated patients on both sides and uh, similar on both sides. And this is the flow chart, uh, the consort flow chart 82, 106 were assessed for. Uh, for eligibility, these were excluded and then uh, randomized to 82 and 40 in each group here, 42. These patients were excluded because they were due perforation, a particular perforation, and 35 in each arm was analyzed. This is the primary objective, the length of hospitalization. We can see that there is around 2.83 reduction in the ERASA, which was statistically significant. All these parameters mean day of withdrawal of nasogastric tube, first platers, first stool, then fluid diet, mean time for solid diet, removal of urinary catheter, all these were, these were statistically significant and reduced, the, the duration was reduced in adaptive ERAS group. Complications, uh, although the trend was there, lesser complications in the, in the ERAS arm, but as such, uh, the, the, it was not statistically significant. Okay, pulmonary complications, urine tract complications, post-operative, nausea and vomiting, all are uh, so similar according to statistical test. So the strengths and limitations of a study, large sample size, inclusion of maximum possible number of air elements in the emergency setting we carried out. We, uh, due to logistic reasons, we are not carrying out minimally invasive approach uh, always in emergency. So all the patients were actually had undergone open surgery. And the cost analysis could not be accurately judged because uh, this is a public sector hospital. So to conclude, the uh, ERAS pathways are feasible, efficacious, and safe for application select patients undergoing emergency small bowel surgery without an increase in the rate of complications. Actually, we saw a trend towards uh, reduced complications. Length of hospitalization was significantly reduced around close to almost three days in the ERAS arm when compared to the uh, standard arm, and this study demonstrate that ERAS protocol can be used, albeit in a modified form, in an emergency setting in patients undergoing small bowel surgery.
Thank you very much. Thank you for that. Yeah, that was a fantastic professor. Thank you for presenting and for submitting the work. I congratulate you, you on the randomized Thank controlled you. trial. Uh, it's Thank amazing you. stuff in, in the emergency setting, no less using ERAS. I think this is really cutting edge uh, sort of stuff and, and thinking about the modifications are just really, really great stuff. Um, a couple of questions came to my mind as you were talking. Uh, so first with your randomization, it didn't look like you stratified for any variables. You didn't think up front of uh, anything that perhaps uh, you might need to stratify for. Is, is that right? Yeah, we have not stratified for anything. Actually, we were thinking that since it's randomized, uh, confounding variables would get balanced on both sides. And yeah. uh, we were not sure whether any particular uh, uh, factor would be there which will actually influence uh, the length of hospitalization. Particularly, that sure. was the primary outcome. So that is the reason we didn't uh, stratify any, yeah. with any factor. Yeah. That's great. And it also seems as if uh, fluid resuscitation in this, in this group of patients may have to be thought of a little differently. Did you, uh, your goals of resuscitation here, what do you typically use in your elective uh, surgical patients under, undergoing ERAS versus in, in this emergency setting? Do you use some different goals for resuscitation? Yeah, actually, uh, that's the primary, uh, one of the important components of ERAS protocol. Although we are not using the typical goal-directed fluid therapy, but we are using the CVB guided fluid therapy in such a manner that in ERAS protocol, whether it's elective or in emergency setting, there is no overloading of the fluid. So that mm. is what we carried out. Yeah. We have not yeah. used any stoke volume, anything to find out actually the, the, the documented uh, goal directed fluid therapy, but we use the CVP. Yes, yeah, so you're using CVP. You use that yeah. as well in your elective situations? Yeah, the same thing. Um, we got a couple of questions that have come up here. Um, let's see. So first, uh, do you consider electrolyte imbalance while assessing return of bowel sounds? Uh, yeah, we are actually all patients of uh, in the emergency setting, even in the elective setting, they will have uh, routine post-operative uh, emergency uh, electrolytes being done on serial path you know, on uh, serial measurements and. Uh, we did not find any particular difference that uh, any electrolyte imbalance has led to any delay in uh, resolution of ileus in this particular setup, what we studied around 80 patients, and that affecting the cause of uh, delay in the length of hospitalization. Okay. And then a second question from one of our uh, uh, um, webinar participants is what antibiotics were used for the five day period? described in the post-op protocol, and did all patients receive the same dose of antibiotics? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, basically, it's the departmental protocol antibiotics. We use uh, 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 cephalosporins and then for gram-negative, the standard protocol, and uh, we all, always use uh, imidazoles with that. Yeah. These are antibiotics. Antibiotics like were similar on both, both, the arms. both the arms. Yeah, great. Yeah. That's wonderful. So I, I'm curious about the... Um, about the, the goal-directed therapy in ERAS. And I'd like to ask, Dr. Fashera, do you guys use any, in your um, ERAS protocol, do you have any goal-directed therapy that you guys implement or that you, you all utilize there in Dallas? Yeah, we have uh, in, the, uh, in the protocol some uh, standardized parameters. We do not use uh, uh, Doppler for that matter. Um, and, uh, and we have some uh, very strict parameters in, in terms of the amount of fluids that we uh, administer intraoperatively based primarily on um, vitals and, uh, and urine output. We do not do any invasive uh, monitoring. We don't use any invasive monitoring. Um, Stefan has asked a question here. Visual actually monitoring is one of the methods. Transesophageal monitoring, uh, invas it is invasive monitoring for uh, goal-directed fluid therapy, transesophageal. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stefan's asked a question here. Um, he's asking if, if there are any dis difference in readmissions. He may have missed no, that, he acknowledges. No, 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 no difference in readmissions. Stefan, how about Actually, you guys at the Cleveland, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Dr. Kate. Yeah, none of the patients had any uh, uh, readmissions, none of the patients had any reoperations. No leaks were there. In no readmissions, congratulations. Yeah. Stefan, how about you guys there at the Cleveland Clinic? What do you use for goal-directed therapy for your uh, ERAS protocols? 
Yeah, we also are not really doing uh, anything special. We're trying to use a zero balance fluid approach. We know that uh, restrictive um, therapy is actually harmful. It increases renal failure. Um, and the standard of the former standard of care of just flooding them with volume is just not results in an excessively high rate of ileus. So we try to go for the, you know, the um, slate to the right of the bottom of the inverse, but the U-shaped curve. Um, just erring on the side of restricting the amount of fluid rather than um, or not giving them too much, so to speak. But we're not using any special equipment here at Dartmouth. We were using um, the various combination of the um, arterial line, Lidco, and other product, cheetah products to try to help um, with the goal-directed therapy. But here in Cleveland, we're not doing goal-directed therapy. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, the CVP is really novel, but it, I guess it requires a central line on everybody, huh, Dr. Kate? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, it's great work anyway. Thank you for, for presenting. And again, a thank randomized you. controlled thank trial you with the settings. Just thank impressive. you for the opportunity. Yeah, thank yeah, you. thank you for coming. On behalf of oh. all my authors, I would like to thank for this opportunity. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for, thank you for submitting and, and for joining us at uh, 1 o'clock in the morning, 1.30 in the morning, yeah. I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's that's 106 great. now. Yeah. yeah, that's wonderful. Well, let's, let's yeah. move on then to our last presentation. Um, last presentation for the day comes from the Mayo Clinic. Uh, Dr. Virovich, you're... Yuri Ivangovic uh, is going to present long-term outcomes of ruan y gastric diversion after failed surgical fund application in a large cohort. Let me go ahead and share your screen, Virovich. And okay, I share my screen now. Thank you. And it's working. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for this great opportunity to present my work. I have nothing to disclose. So, surgical fund application is a standard surgery for GERD. Uh, its efficacy decline over time. Up to 20% could develop symptom recurrence or dysphagia related to a dysfunctional wrap. We do fund application is a viable option, but it is associated with higher complications and lower success than a primary operation. Conversion to ruan y gastric diversion is an alternative approach. It could alleviate GERD by acid and biodiversion and relief of dysphagia from the takedown of the prior wrap. However, this surgery is considered challenging uh, with adhesion and scarring from prior surgeries. We aim to study long-term outcomes and advert events after ruin y gastric diversion for failed fund application. This was a retrospective study in a single tertiary referral center. Patients were adults who underwent ruin y gastric diversion for, uh, with fund application takedown for failed fund application. The study period was from 1995 to 2019. Failed fund application was defined as persistent or recurrent intractable GERD or having symptoms related to a dysfunctional wrap warranting an operation. Ruan y gastric diversion was done with complete takedown of the previous fund application. Esophageal jejunostomy was performed if the stomach was not viable. Regarding our subjective endpoints, GERD resolution was defined as discontinuation of acid blockers in the absence of GERD symptoms. GERD recurrence was defined as recurrence of the symptoms with a resumption of acid blockers. Severity of dysphagia were classified uh, as no dysphagia, mild dysphagia, and severe dysphagia based on the ability to take liquids or solids. New onset dysphagia and percent severe dysphagia were defined as their symptoms compared to their baseline symptoms before the surgery. These were all done uh, based on a chart review. Regarding our objective endpoint, as some of the patients underwent, Upper endoscopy, esophagram, and or high-resolution manometry if clinically indicated. Patients who had pre, uh, paired pre and post endoscopy and esophagram were assessed for changes in the degree of esophagitis, barrier esoph esophagus, and esophageal diameter. High-resolution manometry were reviewed by a single investigator who was blinded to the patient outcomes. 
results. During the 24-year study period, 101 patients were reviewed. The mean age was 52 years, 86% uh, was female. The mean BMI was 35.8. The median follow-up duration was 56 months. About one third of the patients underwent more than one fund application before the gastric diversion surgery. The main indication of this surgery was GERD in about 96%. A subset of the patients underwent this surgery for their bloating or dysphagia. 15% underwent esophageal gestinostomy, whereas the race underwent gastric bypass. An open approach was performed in almost uh, half of the patients. Regarding our clinical outcomes, good resolutions after the surgery was achieved in 70%. In those who achieved initial resolution, they developed GERD recurrence in almost 40% of the patients. New onset dysphagia and persistent severe dysphagia were experienced in about 50% of the cohort. Regarding our objective outcomes, Isophagram uh, pre and post test was done in 20 patients. There was no significant, significant change in the esophageal diameter after the surgery. Endoscopy was done in 40 patients who had like pre and post endoscopy. As you can see here, esophagitis was worsened after the surgery in 10%, and the grade of the Barrett esophagus was worsened after the surgery in 7.5% with the median duration of the endoscopy of 26 months after the surgery. Regarding the high resolution manometry, nine patients underwent this test after the surgery given their dysphagia symptoms. Five of these patients had abnormal uh, esophageal motility as shown here. Four of these five had no pre-op dysphagia. The complications was de uh, defined based on the claven dindo classification. And early severe complications were experienced in 22%. Late severe complications were experienced in 36% of the cohort. The most common uh, complications were related to anastomosis, as you can see, like leak and stricture. Almost 40% of the patients experience recurrence of their GERD symptoms after initial improvement. And 7.5% of the patient had worsening Barrett esophagus in those who had Barrett at baseline. Question remain regarding possibility of uh, reflux that could be noxious to the esophagus after the surgery. Almost half of the entire cohort had either persistent or new onset dysphagia. Eight of these patients were found to have anastomotic stricture and underwent endoscopic uh, dilation with no improvement of their dysphagia symptoms. So this dysphagia could be multifactorial from either anatomical cause or motility abnormalities. Limitations, this was a retrospective study. Clinical outcomes were uh, obtained from a chart reviewed, no questionnaire data available. The clinic visits and objective assessment were done at different intervals. And it was a long study duration. So the approach has changed over time in terms of surgery. And this was conducted in a tertiary care referral center that could limit the generalizability of the outcomes. Ruang Y gastric diversion is an effective surgery in a subset of patients who had failed for duplications. However, patients should be informed regarding the risks of post-operative GERD symptoms that could recur, dysphagia that could be persistent, and surgical-related complications. Referral for a careful evaluation by a multidisciplinary focus team is warranted. Thank you. That's a great presentation, Dr. Yervanovich. Um, just excellent and uh, brings up a lot of uh, good questions that I suspect Dr. Shada is going to uh, have. She's going to kick us off. Uh, Dr. Amber Shada from the University of Wisconsin uh, will be uh, starting us off with her commentary. Dr. Shada. Dr. Jeru Vong Vanich, I'd like to <laughs> congratulate you on um, this study. It's a 
fantastic single series study in a very complicated patient population. Um, second fund application is never uh, easy and patients are often dissatisfied, um, let alone a third. So this is a very complex group of people. I congratulate you on uh, looking at them in depth. Um, Thank you. The, um, the use of dysphagia and GERD um, in follow-up by chart review is also challenging. So I'd say that the lack of sort of validated symptom scores is probably um, the one thing I miss the most in this um, study, and I know that's hard to do in a retrospective study. The questions I have for you, um, one is about dysphagia. So when you're looking at dysphagia postoperatively in these people, um, can you use the caliber change on esophagram or any other parameters on esophagram to kind of correlate um, esophagram findings with those uh, patients who had dysphagia? Yeah, so first uh, we look at the esophagram by seeing the diameter changes to see whether the surgery has impact on the size of the esophagus or not, which we didn't see that. And regarding the symptom of dysphagia, we found no association with the uh, esophagram as well. Unfortunately, only a subset of the patients had the esophagram. Uh, yeah, and we found no different uh, in those group as well, 20 patients. Um, the second question is relating to GERD. So when you're doing um, a gastric diversion for recurrent GERD, um, many people believe that it's a fantastic operation to completely resolve GERD. So to have such a high rate of patients with GERD postoperatively is intriguing. And I would just I would wonder what you think the reason is for that. And um, as a secondary question to that, was hiatal hernia looked at at all, either on esophagram or endoscopy post-surgery? Yeah, so the first question as to why the room-wide gastric diversion could be a potential surgery for GERD patients. Uh, for sure that it's been shown that the data show good outcomes to divert acid uh, bile from that area to come up to the esophagus, and that could uh, mitigate the GERD symptoms. However, a uh, recent study has shown that wrong white gastric diversion or wrong white gastric bypass may not preserve the esophageal function than uh, that pre we, we believed. They, they've been shown that uh, the pre post uh, esophageal manometry showed an increased risk of ineffective esophageal motility after this surgery as well. Uh, but I think the evidence is still not. Uh, that's strong and then need more study regarding that area. And in this cohort, uh, we, uh, we didn't specifically like address the head of hernia uh, regarding the, uh, didn't collect that data, but patients who had the hernia underwent uh, the repair as well, along with the fund application, uh, takedown and the gas reversion. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, we've got two questions that, that have come in from Dr. Ribeiro in the question and answer set uh, part here. They're both sort of related. So the first is the size of the gastric remnant. What's the size of your gastric remnant? And the second is the length of the afferent bowel lane in these patients. Yeah. So the, the size, uh, the, the length of the afferent limb? Yes. So it's varied, and then we didn't get from all of the uh, surgery note. If they all ones, we couldn't obtain that, and it's varied from 100 to 150. So I do a longer limb. Okay, and the gastric remnant on average? Oh, yeah. So that that one we don't have the information here. Don't have the information. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I have to tell you, Virovich, I think I might have found another disease that I don't ever want, which is recurrent. Uh, GERD after having a Nissen. This sounds like a terrible problem. Being a colorectal surgeon, I don't know much about it, but the outcomes don't look to be great to me because it looks like half of your patients have recurrent symptoms either by diagnosis or back on an acid blocker. 
So yes. if that's the case, I mean, what, what, what's the answer for these patients? It, it, yeah, so it may, be have, this, it may be esophago jejunosmia or ruin Y gastric diversion, but that doesn't seem to be ideal either. So what, what, what are other options? Yeah, so this group of patients didn't do well with the redo fund, fund application. That's why they were offered this surgery to help yeah. their GERD symptoms. And then we've been seeing this in our clinic that as a far as a long term, that they uh, start to have the symptom back in again and also suffer with the dysphagia symptom as well, along with the GERD symptoms needed to be on medication. That's why we conducted this study to see uh, the entire cohort, uh, especially the long term outcomes. And yeah, that we, we, we couldn't uh, recommend like any good option as of now. Yeah. yeah. What do you think about links? Is that going to play a role rather than this radical uh, ruin Y gastric diversion? Could links play a role as an adjunct or something else? Yeah, so uh, I yeah have not yeah no idea. Not much experience yeah. about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I suspect not. I Amber, I don't be know. Interesting to study more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But t links typically not used after a fund application has been put up. So first time only. Great. Uh, Stefan, you have a question? Yeah. I have a question. Are there any, I know I'm old enough to remember propulsive and um, patient cisapride and patients <laughs> really loved it. They, they felt it was a panacea for their GERD symptoms, but it had a, was withdrawn from the U.S. market. So my first question is, are there any newer medications um, coming down the line that you're aware of that might help um, increase gastric emptying? And my second question is, from a colorectal perspective, similar to Greg, Dr. Kennedy, who I don't really know a lot about this, but it would seem that you're doing the bypass to try to increase gastric drainage. So has anyone looked at just trying to do a pyloroplasty to try to increase the gastric emptying? Okay, yeah, thank you for your questions. So some of, the, some of these patients had like a gastric motility problem as well as part of previous surgery, injuring the nerve around that area. Uh, to my knowledge, there's no new medic, uh, there, there, there must be any, uh, like uh, some new medications undergoing a trial now to improve the gastric motility, but none has come to like uh, close to be used uh, so far to my knowledge. Yeah, under study. And what was your quest, uh, second question again, sorry? about whether there's any role for a pyloroplasty to try to increase gastric drainage. Yeah, so some of these uh, patients also underwent the pyloroplasty too. We didn't include in this cohort because they got this uh, impaired gastric motility. Yeah, despite those in a subset of patients who underwent the surgery, some of them could also develop GERD recurrence after the surgery. Thank you. Yeah, I have to tell you, Stefan, I, I love the Cisapride question. I wish we still had it. That doggone Torsades just, just took it right off the market, though. Huh? That did work really well. Uh, let's see. The second question, we have another question here from Dr. Diaz. Did you reevaluate for functional esophageal problems? Yeah. So this patient uh, only retrospect reviewed, and some of them got this uh, high resolution manometry to assess the motility problem with the dysphagia symptoms. Nine patients got manometry and five of them got abnormal motility disorder. And all of these, they got endorsed as well, didn't show any stricture or anything in their area. Great. Good. Well, I, I don't see any other questions in our chat box or in the QA box. If the panelists don't have any other questions, I think this has been just a spectacular session. I want to Thank the panelists, thank our presenters specifically, Dr. Kate for joining us from South India, Viravish from joining us from the, uh, that uh, weather's trodden Mayo Clinic up there in Rochester. It's probably pretty nice by now, I guess. Probably just lost the, the winter last week. So thanks for joining. Um, Stefan, thank you for your presentation. Excellent job, all three of you. I really enjoyed this. Uh, next week will be the fourth, uh, episode of the SSAT webinar. So please hope everyone can join in and uh, stay safe. And thanks again.